Good evening. This is Carlton Kuhn. I'm so excited to be with you today. And um, we've just, uh, I guess this will be our fourth webinar, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to spend some time with you. And um, I hope you're having a wonderful spring. Spring, of course, is a time when people tend to go back to church, and uh, so it's a great growth season. We're going to try during the summer to do a little push ourselves. It's been a long time since uh, we've taken that approach during the summer, so it's going to be somewhat interesting. Uh, but I, I think that maybe it's a strategic time. We have several new home Bible studies, we have several new believers, and we have um, a number of uh, new families regularly visiting the church, and that's, that's very exciting. I'm Carlton Kuhn. I pastor a growing church in Springfield, Missouri, Calvary, United Pentecostal Church. My wife and I have been involved in a number of different aspects of ministry through the years, and uh, all of them we have been blessed to see grow, and of course I think that growth uh, that we should measure should be the growth that comes as we make uh, disciples as a result of making conversion, and then we develop people, of, of course, along the way. I've written a few books along the way of uh, my journey in life. The most recent is Details Matter, which is an overview of some of the responsibilities that we have in administering the local church and helping grow that church to be uh, what it should be and recognizing that uh, accomplishing that is not going to happen unless somebody is taking care of the details. I'm not here to talk with you about that today, but if you'd be interested in it, uh, if you visit my website, the information is there on the screen just above or below where you're looking, Carlton Kuhn Sr., that's just SR, Carlton Kuhn SR, Dot com. Uh, you can get more information about Details Matter. Um, also, if you're coming to uh, one of our webinars for the first time, uh, I'm thankful that all of our webinars are now available on a YouTube channel, and uh, you can go there and examine the things that we've talked about over the last few weeks, or months, excuse me. Uh, we've talked about overcoming sociological issues and growing a church and, and winning and keeping new disciples. We talked about establishing some why concepts, so you may want to go and take a look at, uh, at some of that. Our time today is going to involve several things. First of all, I want God's church to be effective. And when I say I want God's church to be effective, I don't just mean days that... I've just kind of explored along, and I'm kind of a plotter in a whole lot of ways. Uh, I think that most significant things are actually accomplished that way. But some things that I've come to discover really helped in us moving toward getting people active and engaged and participating. And then, of course, I want to respond to your questions, as I always do. If for some reason uh, we don't get to all of those questions, uh, we'll come back later and respond to those via email or uh, here on, on the Facebook page. Thanks again for being here. I don't take the time lightly, nor do I take it for granted that you would choose to spend part of a Tuesday with me. Uh, something to jot down is my email address, carltoncoonsenior at gmail.com. Also the website, carltoncoonsenior.com. That ought to be your favorite website on the Internet because I do regular blog posts there. There are resources. We also have a number of guest bloggers who will be coming alongside with greater information. And uh, you can always email me with questions, and I do my best to respond to that as well. I don't have all the answers, but maybe I can just share with you uh, in the misery of it being a question sometimes. More important now, moving on to the idea of the church that you are part of having full employment. Now, again tonight, we're going to do, as I almost always do, we're going to talk about problem, and then we're going to talk about solution, and then we're going to recognize that the solution has to be captured with a system. We've got to become systematic on the things that matter to the body of Christ. Just as you can't wait till you have three people to start a new convert class or bear fruit class, you can't you cannot wait until you have a dozen people in the church who are newcomers to say, "Wow, we got to get these people involved." 
you have to do it systematically and it has to be a consistent part of your ministry. Um, I, I do think there's a problem. Uh, somebody said, and I ran across this quote yesterday in my study, uh, if a car had as many non-working parts as some churches, it wouldn't run downhill. Wow, I think that's absolutely the truth. So let's take that a step further. What does it mean for the parts to be working? What does it mean for people in the church to be active? Uh, does it mean that they attend regularly? Is that being active? Does it mean that they regularly bring their tithe and offering? Is that being active? Well, in my opinion, it really isn't. Because the church needs more than people who will attend, and it needs more than people who will give. Both of those are important, obviously, but there's more to this thing of being a healthy body than simply uh, just showing up and making a, a financial contribution. So the church in the scripture is like a body. Now, if we talk about our physical body, there are glands and there are organs and there's the limbs and ligaments. There's these eyes and ears and all of the rest that make this physical body what it is. All of the things that I mentioned play a very important and specific part in this human body being a healthy human body and accomplishing what this human body is ultimately able to accomplish. If we were to sit down with a scientist or a physician, they could tell us what each part of this human anatomy is intended to accomplish. God made us fearfully and he wonderfully made us and he made us where that there's nothing wasted here. Every single part in the human body has a responsibility in order for the body to be healthy and effective. Now, I have the eye and then I have ligaments that are in my arm. The eye and the ligaments in my arm are not interchangeable. They're both needed, but they're not interchangeable. So for the body to be thoroughly effective, it needs all of these various aspects working together. Uh, would there not be a problem if tonight two-thirds of your physical body was not employed doing the work that God designed it to do. What if, uh, what if both kidneys and one lung and and uh, maybe the right side of your body entered into paralysis and it just went on strike and it didn't participate? Would you be able to go to work tomorrow? Would you be productive for your family? And the truth of the matter is that all of us know that uh, that would not be the case at all. The scripture likens this body of Christ to that human body. We are we're put together. We're fit together. We, we're not on life support, but instead everybody in this thing is working together to help us be what we can be for God. I think today that, that uh, the analogy is out. If uh, a person had two-thirds of their physical body not working, that body would be on life support. Uh, if not dead, actually would probably be deceased, but just not buried yet. Um, I think that we have churches that are on life support. Churches that are not doing any work of evangelism. Churches that are not systematically uh, making converts. That are not working to take that one or two converts that they may be getting a year and truly making them disciples of Christ and doing that in a systematic way. Not seeing productivity, not seeing growth. That's an unfortunate thing, and it should not be uh, the case. So we, we, have to, we have to look for something better. We have to look for solutions to go beyond what we have been in the past. Now, each part of the body of Christ has a functioning purpose. Each person is to fulfill that purpose. As is true, uh, as people come into our churches, um, we can't wait until we have a multitude in order to seek a way to engage them. We need to let these newcomers know that this is not going to be uh, spiritual welfare. It's not going to be that we will carry you, 
but that there is an intentional expectation that you are going to have a functional role in the body of Christ. Now, we can hope that that's the outcome. You can, you can imagine, you can wish, but a hope and a wish won't get you very far in what I'm describing. You have to have an intentional strategy if you're going to get people gainfully employed in the work of God. So I would challenge you tonight after I'm through or after you have come on later and looked at this, I challenge you to sit down and make a list of everybody that's in your church from, say, 15 years old and older, and then check off the ones who have a defined role of ministry. That means there's a job description. There's a responsibility. If they're not there, something goes undone, or somebody has to replace them in getting it done. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about having people gainfully employed. I think that a lot of people who say, oh, we're a great church, we're a healthy church, when they look and assess themselves on that basis, they're not going to be as encouraged with the outcome. Let me digress here to observe that I think part of what's got us to this point is that uh, for, for perhaps a generation, the only ministries that we tended to honor were those that were platform-based ministries. And so we celebrated preachers, and we celebrated musicians, and we celebrated singers, but the people who did behind-the-scenes work, the people who had the gift of giving, or the people who had um, the gift of serving, the people who had uh, grace as part of their attributes, those people were never celebrated. And so we ended up, I think, with people always aspiring to that thing that was talked about, and we ended up with people preaching who maybe were not preachers, and uh, trying to sing, we're not singers, and, and because it was the thing that we celebrated, it was the thing that we, we talked about. Now, I challenge you to do that percentage thing. Uh, when I did that several years ago, and I have not done it yet at Calvary, uh, because we have some work to do to get where we need to be with this, but when I did it, we were at a church of, of several hundred people, and uh, when I sat down and analyzed this, I discovered that 22% of the adult people who came to our church were gainfully, actively involved in a meaningful role of ministry. Well, I decided that wasn't healthy. No wonder we were a bit stagnant and we're not growing in a meaningful way. But I have good news for you, that while that may be the case for you, and it may even be fewer than that in your instance, there can be systematic, sustained processes, some things that I'm going to share with you. You don't have to do it the way I did it. You can experiment, you can figure it out for yourself, but do something that gets people intentionally involved in ministry. Um, now, I have discovered, after having invested a lot of time in that, that uh, you can get a church to where it's about two-thirds of the people are actively involved in a meaningful role of ministry. Uh, there are others who are elders, some have health issues, some have challenges with their family, um, and then there are a few who are simply slothful and don't want to do anything. And uh, of course we want to serve those who are elders and we want to honor them all the way through the journey because many of them were teaching Sunday school and did so for 30 and 40 years. Many of them worked as ushers and part of a hospitality team for a very, very long time. So we never minimize their significance. You can reach a point where that all available help is put to work. Here are the problems that I see with church unemployment. First of all, is that we burn out the people who are willing to work. Too few people trying to do too much. There are too few willing hands, and eventually those people are simply exhausted. And just a sidebar, I think that the vast majority of churches are trying to do too much. And uh, sometimes we need, matter of fact, let me recommend the book Simple Church to go uh, buy and uh, just just uh, make that a purchase because Simple Church will help you define the things that really matter. So the first challenge is burnout. The second is that if we don't have a strategy for engaging our converts, we are either going to use them, as Kenneth Haney would say, or we're going to lose them. The third observation I make about this 
business of employing people is that the critics in your church are going to be the people who are inactive. People who are busy rowing the boat don't have time to drill a hole in the bottom of it. And so get people active and involved, and they're much more content with the journey. The fourth thing that I think is important is that if the responsibility is just to put in an appearance, um, or if the responsibility is to give an offering, and again, both of those things are important, the truth of the matter is that those two levels don't produce much commitment to the church. It's easy to be gone because there is no real sense of personal engagement. The floor doesn't look good today. I didn't do my vacuuming. Um, that newcomer was not welcomed because I, I didn't take care of my hospitality area of ministry. We need to get people committed as part of this process of Velcroing and them eventually gluing them into the work of God. So let me give you some solutions now, and then we're going to talk about how to strategically accomplish this. The first thing is that you need to define and value the resources that God has given to the church. Uh, profound discovery came to me in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, where it lists a group of gifts that God has given that I think are motivational gifts. And each person born on this planet, I am convinced God puts a motivational gift in them. And it is his intent that that motivational gift be used for him. Okay? So we have people who have the gift of leadership. They lead corporations. They lead businesses. And then they come to church and they watch us attempt to do things that maybe we're not equipped to lead. It would be like me attempting to build a church building while I have men like Ed Texter, who was a profound contractor, or Terry Newman, who was another great contractor, and me trying to be the decision maker, me trying to be the one who was saying, here's what we're going to do. That's, that's foolish. And so these gifts are given for the enhancement of the body of Christ, and we have to understand them and we have to value them. When I was a young man, this happened to me 28 years ago, I ran across a great book. This is Discovering Your God-Given Gifts by Don and Katie Fortune. I was so impressed with this book that I actually found Don and Katie Fortune's phone number and I called them. Uh, I wasn't thinking about it, but their phone number was in Seattle. I was sitting in my office in Louisiana and um, it was 8.30 there. It was 6.30 in Seattle. They answered the phone. They were very gracious in their comments to me. They sent me additional information. Uh, Discover Your God-Given Gifts remains one of the ten most impacting books of my life and ministry because it helped me see that the church was underemployed and that we could not be effective until we figured out some intentional strategy to help people find their gifts and then move into exercising and operating those gifts for the glory of God. So recognizing those gifts, coming to learn about them, and knowing that no person sitting in your church does not have a motivational gift. Now as a leader, as a church leader, as a pastor, part of my responsibility is to help those folk in the congregation discover their motivational gift and then to help them put that to work. If you don't employ the people that God is giving you who could help you as an usher or who could help you with doing a little building project, if you're not using them, if you're not employing that young lady who is 16 to help with the nursery, why should God send you additional people to join your unemployment line? Come on, folks. We've got to get intentional about getting people active and in ministry. Okay, so we understand those gifts. And then the second thing is we have to value each of those gifts. You say, oh, Brother Coon, you're the key point of what's happening at Calvary. And everything depends on you. And so... We can minimize the dear lady who works at our 
church regularly, uh, vacuuming the floors and cleaning and putting paper goods out. And we could say, oh, that's, that's not important. Well, let's just go a month and don't do that. Don't do that at my church. Don't, don't vacuum floors. Don't clean anything. Uh, don't have anybody wash the towels after you baptize people. Come on. In just a few months, in just, it will be months, in a few weeks, you're going to have people knocking on your door saying, hey, wait a minute, this is a mess. What's going on here? And it's because we have devalued this other person. We've said that's not important. Well, I'm sorry, it is important. And we need to intentionally find a way to see those gifts and value those gifts and put them to work. So, now, how do you pursue full employment? How can I get the church that is at 22% to where it's at 60%? Number one, understand the motivational gifts. Don and Katie Fortune's book would be a recommend. Uh, out of it, that and some other things that I read, I eventually developed my own tool, and we use this with our church and also with new converts. It's called Fitly Framed. It's seven lessons uh, on a CD, or you can download the thing too, I think. Um, and uh, hundreds of churches have actually put that to use. Uh, Sister Tenny wrote a book, Thetis Tenny wrote a book, uh, So You Want to Grow, that travels over some of this same terrain. You have to understand motivational gifts. You have to see this as part of the way God has put his church together and has put his people together. Secondly, after you understand motivational gifts as a church leader, you begin teaching those concepts to your church. Uh, again, I've taught Calvary fitly framed. I will probably teach it again to them, and then uh, we will use some better strategy. I taught it. We did gift tests. We really didn't employ folks to the degree that we will in the future, but I taught it, and I'm acquainting them with the process of each of us being wonderfully made and intended of God to be used for his glory. So now I've taught it and I give folks a gift test. So understand it, then teach it, give the gift test, recognizing that you're going to have to cover the same territory a number of times with your existing congregation for it to actually take hold. Okay, thirdly, in this process, as a pastor, for those who are coming into your church, and then for leaders in your church, if you're beyond that stage of being a church planner, you are going to have to develop job opportunities that put people to work. You can't talk about, hey, you need to be busy for God, and then not have something for them to do. So you're also going to have to engage your church leaders because they have to be responsible for coming up with job opportunities. So you've got to have buy-in from your leadership team. Okay, you've got to include things that uh, a virtual newcomer, somebody comes to church, they've been coming for every service for two weeks, they say, boy, I want to be active. You say, well, uh, you go through these next 27, 28 weeks of teaching, uh, you get baptized, you receive the Holy Ghost, we'll put you to work. Well, mark it down. There won't be many of those folks still there at the end of that journey. So you have to stretch yourself. You may even have to do some things that stretch you outside your comfort zone to find a way to get people actively involved in ministry. Okay, uh, and then as our newcomers come in, I teach a, a bear fruit class, which is our second level of new convert care. Those that are going through that class right now will eventually go through Fitly Frame. Um, and um, it's just part of our disciple-making process. Uh, the ones who are just finished this week with their Take Root class that is taught to them by Pam Eddings on Wednesday night, uh, that group will uh, come to my Bear Fruit class, and then they will go to Fitly Frame. So it's an ongoing, does it ever stop? No. It's perpetual. It's, it's never ending. That's where the idea of system comes in. It's, the, the earth has this planetary system. It has the system of, of day and night and all the rest because it's, it's repeated. It's ongoing. Well, when I talk about systems, that's what I'm talking about. It's things that you're going to do over and over again. 
you can't be effective growing people. And most of us, and I cannot, be effective growing a church using what is called one-off approaches where that everything's brand new and we're just doing something that we've never done before all the time. So Fitly Framed is the resource that we use. I'll share more with you about that. People go through Take Root, Bear Fruit, and then they come to Fitly Framed. Those seven lessons have been powerfully impacting and uh, they have benefited churches and pastors all over the world. So full employment. It's going to take strategy, it's going to take consistency, it's going to take system, and it's going to take sustainability. So let's talk our way through that. Number one, as a church leader, do you want people involved? Are you doing things that other people could do? Secondly, if you're not content with the way things are, are you willing to slow down and learn about the motivational gifts by reading Don and Katie Fortune's book, or maybe exploring my stuff, or doing both would be what I would recommend. What I'm describing is not going to be something you can accomplish in the next two or three days, or even in a couple of weeks. You're going to have to slow down and say, I've got to, this is building block stuff that I'm talking about. You've got to get the building blocks in place. Okay. Third thing, then you teach what you have learned. Fourth, you begin to put to work those tools that employ your existing group. Uh, if you don't use Fitly Framed, if you don't use my gift test, Don and Katie Fortune had stuff in theirs. Uh, grade was another one that I gained great benefit from. I read about six or so different things. Um, each newcomer goes through it, repeat, 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 repeat. That's the way you're going to be successful with this. Then when you welcome newcomers, whether you do that monthly or quarterly, you do it with a comment about their ministry. We don't want you here to just sit and watch, but we expect you to have a ministry among us. And then regularly talk about and celebrate people who get things done behind the scenes. I taught a Bible study a while back to Chris and Chris Carr, uh, has taken it this summer, and I think has taken care of the church property every single week as far as mowing and weeding and all the rest. The property looks so great. I mentioned it this weekend. I celebrated it. Uh, I try to celebrate on occasion those who clean the church. Do it because if you don't, uh, the notice is not going to be given, and the other people who have similar giftings are not going to feel that what they might do has any merit or any significance. Okay, The next thing that I'm going to mention in passing is that we uh, had and will eventually have, the Lord willing, an annual job fair where that every ministry in the church sits up a booth with the, <coughs> excuse me, with the intent being to recruit workers. A lot of work, a lot of fun, and it also through the years got progressively better as our employment levels went up, we had fewer and fewer people who were available for people to try for our leaders to try to campaign to get on their team, and so it it uh, they they really got creative with some of that stuff, and then also something like an annual job fair. An annual job fair is where those who are in key places of leadership, we had staff members, all the rest, and so we would use them in. Um, through the year, of course, and then we would we would uh, celebrate them with this job fair and uh, have our volunteers vote on volunteer of the year. It's always great fun. Larry and Bethel Bagley had run a bus ministry for years, and and it brought hundreds of kids to church. And uh, Ray Stokes, he would just show up, and he would trim hedges, and some you wanted trimmed, some you didn't want trimmed, and. And, but uh, the volunteers voted them as volunteers of the year, and it was it was a lot of fun. And then, uh, finally, be working toward establishing an HR department for the church, where that somebody actually leads that ministry, and teaches these classes, and finds gifts, and then works with your leaders to put newcomers to work. We're not there yet. Eventually. 
we will be. Now, uh, I mentioned Fitly Framed. Fitly Framed is a great resource. Uh, it's guaranteed. Uh, I think that if you downloaded it today, it's $12. If you want the, uh, the CD, uh, it's 20 And let me be very clear about this. Uh, this resource is something that you can print it as often as you want. You can copy it uh, a thousand times. Obviously, don't sell it because uh, that that's um, protected by copyright. But what I do want you to do is use it in your local church just as often as you as you can. So, if you're interested in Fitly Frame, visit CarltonCoonSenior.com. If you look it over and you say, "Boy, that that stinks." Um, we're happy, as always, to refund whatever you've invested in this. Um, thank you for joining me today. It's been fun. I realize that I've spent 32 minutes with you already. Um, there are a few questions that have bounced by, uh, either through phone or et cetera, and uh, then there's some on Facebook here, and we'll, we'll work to try to answer a few. Some I'll have to come back and do offline, but thank you for your patience with that. Um, questions ask why I use the term fitly framed uh, as uh, this this series for our newcomers, because I view it as, as part of discipleship. Uh, Paul spoke of the church as a building fitly framed together. It's in the book of Ephesians, and I, I think that term perfectly fits for how an effective church is supposed to work. Um, Think about it. The building that you are in right now is made up of many different materials. All of those materials are important. you got shingles or some other kind of roofing. There's a lavatory somewhere in the building. There's flooring. And there's two-by-fours or cinder blocks or something that is establishing a wall. Um, a building is, is not complete without a variety of materials. So the church is a is a is a building fitly framed together. There is a variety of of materials. A pile of shingles forty feet long and thirty feet wide and sixteen feet tall does not make a building. Okay, so that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason is that within a building, the the materials are not interchangeable. Uh, the shingles on your roof will not work for a lavatory, and the sheetrock will not serve as carpet. They're varied, and they have to be put in the right place to be effective in that place. And sometimes we have failed with people because we've tried to just employ them willy-nilly. We've just put them somewhere. Let's get them busy doing something. And so you get somebody who has a gift of service, maybe, um, Marilyn, uh, helps with some things about our church as far as cleaning, and uh, I've thought Mar thought about it quite often that if Marilyn were to be assigned the task of teaching a class on Sunday, she would be miserable. On the other hand, if I were to be the person who cleaned the church, everybody would be miserable because we're not interchangeable. We don't have the same gifts or abilities. And then the third thing that that is part of that title is the materials have to be fit in the frame. Somebody has to put it together, whether it's not just um, a hodgepodge, it is working toward some sort of, of system. So uh, Fitly Frame was the name that, that I came up with. A friend of mine who teaches a similar series as he evangelizes says, boy, I wish I'd have, wish I'd have got that title before you did. Uh, so, so Fitly Frame, you, you teach your own series based on what I've just said. Um, okay, second, second question, is it enough for people to attend church and to bring their tithes and offering? Is that full employment? And uh, a resounding no, 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 no. Uh, there's a motivational gift of giving, and there are a lot of important things that happen at church. We want people to give, and we want people to attend church, but we need to get people active. They need to be involved in ways that connect them doing ministry, serving others, and serving the purpose of the body of Christ. Okay? And I covered this. Apparently, it didn't, didn't get addressed. Does a person need to buy 
a copy of Fitly Frame for each person in their church, and the answer to that is also a resounding no. Uh, with either the download or with the CD that's available, you can copy that as often as you want. Fitly Frame download is, is $12. You can have that tonight. Uh, in the next few minutes, the Fitly Frame CD is $20 plus postage. Either way, copy them as much as you want. Uh, not the CD, but the printouts. I believe in the church. I believe in the church uh, not being a grandstander. I believe in the church becoming a body or a building. Getting people active is vital if you're going to grow people and grow a church. Oh, please go ahead and calendar. My next webinar, last Tuesday in June, 7.30 Central Standard Time. I'll see you then. Uh, my viewings on Facebook and YouTube continue to increase, and questions regularly come even after the Facebook Live training session is over. Uh, give me some input on this. Some have asked about, well, this isn't often enough for some of the topics you're, you're addressing. Could we do it a little more often and maybe make it 15 minutes uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. What are your thoughts about me doing a weekly webinar? Uh, I don't know that I'd always be able to do them using Facebook Live, but of course we can record things ahead of time. I'm interested in your input. I want to serve the body of Christ. I want to serve it in meaningful ways. Thank you for the time that we've spent together today. Get your people actively involved in ministry, and you'll serve a growing church and a much healthier church. God bless you.